Good afternoon. My name is Bennett Tarleton. I work at the Tennessee Performing Arts Center. Our speaker today uh, has been inside many places, the CIA, the FBI, uh, Joseph Kennedy's family, uh, and a lot of other places, and now Palm Beach. I really appreciate it when a writer uh, provides what I consider to be the perfect introduction, and I don't have to dig very much. So I want to share just a little tiny bit of the season, uh, which is Ron Kessler's book, and I think it will serve as a really good introduction to him. My aunt, he writes, who lived in Scarsdale, was married to the county's uh, largest importer and distributor of artificial flowers. At their dinners, the chit-chat had to do with their lives, uh, their live-in servants, their trips to Paris, and the weddings they would eventually throw for their daughters at uh, the Pierre and the Plaza. I tried to imagine what their lives must be like. Palm Beach would give me the chance to find out, on a much grander scale, writing books allows me to explore different, secret, powerful worlds. I can live the lifestyle of others without actually becoming a part of it, ask questions I otherwise couldn't ask and learn, as in a cultural anthropological study, about people engaged in pursuits totally different from mine. Palm Beach fit all my criteria. In its own way, the town is as secret as the CIA, FBI, or Secret Service. Unless you know the combination, you don't get in. The residents are not only among the country's richest, they are among the nation's most powerful. And there is no question that the culture of Palm Beach is different. As F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about the very rich, they are different from you and me. And now to tell us about how different the rich of Palm Beach are from you and me, perhaps, is Ron Kessler. Mm. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. John L. Hainer married one of Europe's richest men. He was a tycoon in Italy. In 1980, they moved to the U.S. They bought a whole floor of the Trump Tower in New York. Two years later, they bought a half a floor of the most chic condominium in Palm Beach, the Biltmore. Frank, her husband, indulged her every whim. He bought her a 26-carat diamond ring, a 32-carat sapphire, a million-dollar Picasso, a white Corniche Rolls-Royce. They traveled around the world five times collecting furniture, each item worth $500,000, $300,000. In time, Frank developed leukemia. And in 1995, in March, he died. It was poor timing because March is the middle of the social season. In Palm Beach, everything revolves around the season. And as you know, Palm Beach is the most sinful, debauched, wealthy, self-indulgent place on the planet. So Jana decided that she would embalm her husband and store him for 40 days at the local funeral home until the season was over. As she said to me, I wanted to go to the parties. I wanted to go to the party on the yacht with Ivana. I wanted to go to the party at Mar-a-Lago, Donald Trump's home. Uh, I didn't want to miss the season. I first came to Palm Beach five years ago to do research on Joseph P. Kennedy for my book, The Sins of the Father. Most people don't realize that Palm Beach is actually an island, and it's only 3.75 square miles. Its population year-round is only 9,800. It swells to maybe 25,000 during the season. On this island live some of the wealthiest people in the world, people like Ron Perlman, Donald Trump, uh, Stay Lauder and her sons, uh, an heir to the Campbell Soup fortune, Diana Strawbridge Wister, uh, and you have the old guard with the old money, with names like Ford, DuPont, Pillsbury, coexisting with the nouveau riche, people like James Clark, co-founder of uh, Netscape, of course, Donald Trump. And their whole existence is based on social climbing, 
on going to the right parties, on celebrating the season, and uh, drinking champagne, having fine jewels, uh, eating beluga caviar. Answer machines are, are very rare on the island because the rich have no need to hear from anybody. They have their servants take messages if they happen to be in. Most of the time, they're away at their other homes. And the servants frequently don't speak English very well, so you spend five minutes trying to give them a message, and then very frequently the message comes out wrong. Um, the bill for electricity alone in many of these homes is $5,000 a month. The bill for the property taxes <clears throat> is <clears throat> typically $500,000 a year. Uh, the bill for landscaping might be $140,000 a year. Uh, and yet, these are only homes that most of them use for three or four months during the season. The rest of the time, they're in other places, in France, in Italy, uh, in the Hamptons, in Nantucket. Uh, but I was drawn to this town. It's full of bizarre characters. In fact, the more bizarre you are, the more you're prized, the more you're accepted. Uh, one of them, Neil Cargyle, is from Nashville, in fact, and uh, was a, a cross-dresser, uh, normally a uh, seemingly uh, upstanding businessman with his own company, and yet he would love to dress up in high heels with mini skirts and uh, dance with women at these parties in Palm Beach. Uh, in fact, John Barron, author of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, who previously made an appearance here, I understand he was only on a panel uh, initially before his book came out, uh, wrote about Neil Cargyle in The New Yorker magazine. But um, what happens is when these people congregate in this small little space with all this money and very... Uh, little to do, lots of free time. It's as if laboratory rats were f fed hormones. All the human foibles, all the, the emotions, all the uh, sins of, of, of humanity seem to become magnified. And the stories of what goes on behind the hedges makes nurseries, uh, makes uh, uh, scandalous novels and, and, and uh, uh, TV shows like uh, Dynasty look like nursery rhymes. To tell a story, I decided to focus on a season, uh, to spend time, to go to the balls. I actually uh, spent a whole weekend with Donald Trump, with my wife Pam, flying down on his Boeing 727-100 uh, for the weekend, stayed at Mar-a-Lago with him, went to other events including New Year's Eve with him. Uh, and uh, the cost of fuel alone for that trip down from New York, and I spent more flying up to New York from my home in Potomac, Maryland, than it would have cost to fly directly to Florida. But the cost of fuel for that one trip for that weekend was $40,000. Um, the way the book started was that after I had written the book on Joe Kennedy, my wife Pam and I would go back for vacations. We loved it. And one, after, one evening, uh, we had dinner at Testa's, one of the best Italian restaurants in Palm Beach. We had a bottle of Chardonnay, which is a little more than we are used to, being from Washington. And I was feeling very good. We walked around the block, and I said to Pam, wouldn't it be great to do a book on Palm Beach? And I was just shooting the breeze. But she said, that's the only book I would collaborate with you on because she's also a former Washington Post reporter and also an author. She wrote a book on the spy sites of Washington called Undercover Washington. And so at that point, it became a more serious idea. And besides focusing on the season, uh, I decided, as I got into it, to focus on four characters. Uh, these are people who see what goes on behind the scenes or who are major players themselves. One is Barton Gubelman. She is the social queen of Palm Beach. Uh, she replaced people like Marjorie Mer Merriweather Post and Sue Whitmore and uh, Laddie uh, 
uh, uh, Mary Sanford as the social queen of Palm Beach. The second one is Kirby Kaluris, who is a walker. And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the way high society works, as I was not, a walker is someone who's usually gay, who escorts wealthy women to balls and charity functions. Uh, sex does not enter in, into the deal. That's for gigolos. But uh, they may be paid, they may not be paid. In Kirby's case, he simp simply gets to go to all the events, he, he gets free meals, and he really enjoys what he's doing. He's able to l lead the, li the life of Palm Beach society without ever working. The third character is Kevin O'Day, who's the night manager of Taboo, which is Palm Beach's trendiest bar and restaurant. And Kevin sees what goes on at the bar at night when women worth $5 million let men paw them uh, through their $5,000 dresses, looking for men worth, worth $50 million, and other men uh, who are worth nothing but have only on a blue uh, blazer, as I have on, which is the uniform of Palm Beach. Uh, in the case of women, no stockings as part of the uniform. Uh, go looking for women who are worth $100 million. Uh, and then the fourth character is Lorraine Hillman, a 36-year-old knockout gorgeous blonde who says she can't find a guy in Palm Beach. They're either trust fund babies or uh, they uh, are homosexual or bisexual. And so she, she relates her encounters in Palm Beach, including her sexual encounters. Trust fund babies, of course, are very big in Palm, Be Palm Beach. There are people who exist on trust funds who've never worked a day in their lives. Um, and um, uh, their sole purpose in life really is to decide where to go for lunch and, wh and which restaurant to go to for dinner. Uh, Diana Wis Wister, uh, the person I mentioned before, an heir to the Campbell Soup Fortune, was asked during a divorce proceeding why she didn't answer the door when the process server came to serve her with papers so that she would appear in court. She seemed really puzzled by the question. She sat uh, at the uh, witness stand and just puzzled. And then you could see the light dawning in her mind as she understood what the question meant. She said, I don't answer the door. The servants answer the door. I've never answered a door in my life. Definitely, this is the very rich are very different from you and me. Uh, plastic surgery, of course, is very important. Uh, Cristal champagne is, sol is sold at the only supermarket, the Publix, at $149 a bottle. Uh, one trust fund baby had a Rolls Royce, but he decided that he also needed a red Ferrari. The trust department of the bank thought that was frivolous. so. He bought a red Ferrari and charged it to his American Express Platinum card. The bank automatically paid the charge. Pillowcases in Palm Beach go for $390 each. The mayor has a yacht. The zip code 33480 is so prized that there's a long waiting list at the post office just to sign up for the post office boxes. There is more money, more champagne, and of course, more influ affluence in Palm Beach than all the rest of, Mer of America put together, Marjorie Merriweather Post said. Kissing is important. At one of the balls, the cancer ball that Pam and I went to, as the, ba as the band played on, people went from table to table exchanging kisses. The rich kiss more than anyone else. The air kiss, the double air kiss, the two cheek kiss, the two cheek kiss with lip pressure, the kiss on the lips, the narrowly avoided kiss on the lips, all are unspoken measures of status, appeal, and even affection. To avoid confusion, the popular European style, two cheek kiss travels from right to left. Landing is optional.
Dress, of course, as I said, is, is very important. And in mid-July, a blonde, skimply dressed woman with 44D bouncing breasts came prancing past the long bar at Taboo and stopped at Franklin DeMarco Jr., the co-owner. The Palm Beach strut, all the women have it, but it's especially noticeable at Taboo, where it's de rigueur for the women to straighten up and stick out their chests, enhanced or not, when w walking past the bar. Everyone is looking, they're on display, and they know how to work it. They wear short skirts and simple, expensive clothing, no prints. Low-cut dresses are everywhere, the boobs pot, bought and paid for. Back in 1902, the New York Herald, as it was then called, said not to go to Palm Beach is a serious thing from a social point of view. If you cannot go there, you should at all events say that you're going and then retire from society for a time. I'll let the characters tell their, their own story. Barton Goobman, the social queen of Palm Beach. In early June, just as Barton Goobman, the, first, the grand first lady of Palm Beach and the head of Palm Beach's old guard, was explaining how Palm Beach society works, the phone rang. Oh shit, let the maid take it, the 80-year-old skion said in a gravelly voice. Behind her, beyond the lily ponds and the burgeoning sea grapes, the Atlantic listened. An invitation to one of Goobman's gala dinner parties is coveted more than acceptance by the Everglades or the Bath and Tennis Club, the two WASP clubs that dominate Palm Beach social life and conversation. J. Paul Getty said, if you can actually count your money, then you're not really a rich man. Asked how much she is worth, Goobman responded in kind. I don't know, she said. I don't sit home and count it. I have no idea. Someone must have it on some piece of paper. We have some lawyers and we have accountants and bookkeepers, but Goodman said is said to be worth close to $100 million. When asked about that, she said, is that what it is? I'm glad to know it. I'll spend some money today. When I asked about Palm Beach parties with nude men or nude women as centerpieces, Goodman allowed as how she hadn't been to one, but she said, you got an address? When asked about gigolo, she said, how do you define gigolo? I mean, I think every single man around here is a gigolo. As for the subject of hidden honeys, she had this to say. Mistresses have their own houses, or they're at the Breakers Hotel, or have a chic apartment. In any case, they're of no interest to her. Either the men are sleeping with somebody, somebody else's wife, or they aren't, she said. The Everglades Club and the Bath and Tennis Club, the two WASP clubs, do not admit Jews. Uh, when I first began working on my book on Joe Kennedy, I was aware that anti-Semitism was an important factor in Palm Beach. I wasn't quite aware of how important it was. Uh, Joe Kennedy, in fact, admired Hitler, but uh, when I began doing this book, I learned that it is a major feature of Palm Beach society. So how was I able, how was I able to do that book? I, I learned early in my life that people can tell that I'm Jewish. Not only does my name Kessler sound Jewish, but that I look Jewish. Uh, and, uh, and so I found that uh, I had that impediment to overcome in doing this book. I would point out sometimes that my wife's mother, Edith Johnson, is a member of the DAR, and sometimes that would help and sometimes it wouldn't. Uh, but I, I think that in the end, Palm Beach loves to look at itself in the mirror. And I appear regularly on TV about many of my other previous books, and I've written 12 books, and I think what happened is that they mistook me for a celebrity, and they made an exception. In the end, Pam and I went to the top social functions. Uh, we went to the Red Cross Ball. We went to the Cancer Ball. We were invited to some of the top parties, and uh, we're able to really see what goes on, become friends with, with the people. Of course, there were some who didn't want to talk, uh, but I used my special potions, and uh, in the end, I think I was able to get to almost everybody that I ne needed to get to. Kirby Calurist was another one who, ha who helped. He's the walker, and of course, he knows everyone who is anyone in, in Palm Beach. Everyone here has a game, Kirby said. 
Many women play the game of being society hostess. There is a game to look like you're interested in golf or croquet or horses. Some people want to believe their stories. It's part of the camouflage of not having anything in your life that's disturbing. In Palm Beach, you don't want to have a problem. You don't want to need anything from anybody. If wealthy women buy him a ticket to a charity ball, it's what justifies the games that people play to be seen, he said. It's a victimless, victimless crime. They lead a very indulgent lifestyle when most of the world is in big trouble, Kirby said. Meanwhile, Kirby gets to go to all the right parties and meet the right people. Palm Beach is his stage. Kevin O'Day, the night manager of Taboo. One night at 6.30, a waiter came rushing up to the front of the restaurant with an urgent request. I have to have some Twinkies, the waiter said. This guy at table four is going to pay me $500 if I can get him Twinkies in half an hour. Cut me in and I'll send for the Twinkies, O'Day said. When they arrived, the pastry chef put the Twinkies on a huge plate and surrounded them with raspberry sauce and whipped cream, all decorated. He not only paid $500 for the Twinkies, Kevin said. He tipped $175 on a $600 check. I made $50, O'Day said. One evening, a woman confronted another woman at the bar. I was just in Hong Kong with your husband, she said. He tells me you're just a money-grubbing bitch. The wife threw her drink in the mistress's face. After the bartender called for help, O'Day came over and, and asked what was going on. I'm sleeping with her husband, and I know what she did to him, the mistress explained. I just went up to her and told her. Then she threw a drink at me. The mistress seemed dumbfounded at the woman's reaction. The next day, the husband came in, and O'Day mentioned the encounter to him. The man was shocked, but then he started laughing. It turned out the mistress had mistakenly accosted someone else's wife. Lorraine Hillman, the knockout gorgeous blonde bombshell, 36-year-old. I'm a very open-minded individual, Lorraine Hillman told me, over drinks at the Chesterfield's Leopard Lounge. Having been in entertainment and real estate and marketing, I get to meet a lot of people, but there's such a thing as getting your issues in order. Eligible men that you think are eligible don't know their issues, by which I mean their sexual issues. They don't have their affairs in order. I'm not sure what they are. I don't think they know what they are. I mean they are bisexual or homosexual. I think many of them haven't done anything with men, but don't know who they actually are. Since coming to the island, the blonde bombshell has dated several men and slept with one of them. That man doesn't have his affairs in order, she said. The term says it all. I don't know where the phrase came from. Have you ever heard it? Then she acknowledged that she had coined it. I said to some friends, I'm going to start getting my affairs in order. One said, are you dying? I said, I hope not. But it's a good way of putting it. It came into my head. A sexual affair is in your head. You have to get them in order. When I first came here, she said, I went to the docks. And the docks, of course, have 200-foot yachts, uh, the mayor's yacht. I went to the docks and I went out on a large boat. The person who took me was born in Palm Beach and went to the best parties. He said, have you ever been with any beasts? This was the first indication I was in a bizarre environment. I assume he was referring to animals. I said, no, actually, no, I've never been with any beasts drawing out the word. People assume because guys come to my house and swim in the pool that I'm sleeping with them, she told me, or they knock on the door at all hours of the night. I must live in a retail store here. It's another watering hole. It's impossible to be alone here when you want to be alone. In Palm Beach, you have friendships with the landscaper or the valet or the captain of the boat, and they say, I'm screwing the help. If I invited a respectable man into my home for dinner, I'd be afraid because the next thing you know, I'd be sleeping with him. If you go out with someone to a restaurant or dance with someone, everyone automatically thinks you've slept with him. You're not allowed to have friends. Lorraine sometimes goes topless in her pool, generating more talk in the small town. And by the way, this book has 16 pages of color photos, which include Lorraine Hillman, uh, along with Donald Trump and Mar-a-Lago. Some people have accused me of, of uh, getting Donald to claim that he's running for president because he does play a major role in this book. And uh, the book 
depicts how he operates in Palm Beach and the very uh, unusual uh, way that Palm Beachers look at, at this, at this uh, great example of the nouveau riche. Uh, Donald admits Jews and even a few blacks, including Denzel Washington, to his Mar-a-Lago club, which, which, uh, which to uh, the old guard was rather a scandal. Lorraine said, I'm European, I'm European for Christ's sakes. Tits are tits. I'm un unbounded. You can go topless in Palm Beach on the beach and you get arrested. Not, th not that I'd like to see any breasts here, she said. They're siliconed up. They wouldn't look normal. They would look like two Mount Everest. In the blazing sun, they'd melt. They don't slide down by the armpit. They bounce up. Who do these women think they're kidding? Walking into a restaurant or a party can be scary. The facial surgery in Palm Beach makes everyone look like mu Muppets, she said. A lot of my friends have surgery and look different from month to month. Of course, Roxanne Pulitzer and William Kennedy Smith are very important in Palm Beach, uh, or, or at least William Kennedy Smith was. That's where he was accused of raping someone. He was later acquitted. Roxanne Pulitzer wrote, wrote the, the prize Pulitzer in the 1980s about her uh, divorce from uh, Peter Pulitzer, an heir to the publishing fortune. Uh, I interviewed her and brought the story up to date since that book. Since then, she's been through many divorces, many affairs. Roxanne's personal trainer, Roger Stewart, took responsibility for all this. After months of intense training and bodybuilding, Stewart said he could see trouble coming because he knew that Roxanne's improved body could be dangerous. It's all my fault. I warned her this would happen, he said. When told of her, trainer, her trainer's comments, Pulitzer breathed a sigh of relief. Finally, she said, someone is admitting some blame. And then there's uh, Richard Cowell. He was co-chairman of the International Red Cross Ball, which is the most prestigious position you can have in Palm Beach. Uh, he told me that uh, the, uh, of course, he's a member of the Everglades Club and the Bath and Tennis Club, and he said, the ideal member of, of the club is 35 to 55 years old, is married, has a house. He told me uh, that uh, the average member would have graduated from New England prep schools, such as Andover or Exeter, from Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. Of course, there are exceptions. Even though you went to Harvard or Yale, it doesn't mean you're a gentleman, Cowell said. The fact that the two club, clubs now allow Jewish guests, they don't allow Jewish members, but guests only if they're known to the other members, otherwise even as guests, Jews are not allowed. Uh, the fact that the two club, clubs now allow Jewish guests won't change things much, he said, since members only bring Jews who are gentlemen. According to Cowell, most of the real gentlemen Jews wouldn't want to go to the Everglades or the Bath and Tennis Club. It's the wrong type that wants to go. As a Harvard graduate himself, Cowell fits right in, or so he claims. Under colleges in the social index directory, which is the social directory, he lists himself as Harvard 52, indicating that he graduated from Harvard in 1952. In fact, while Cowell was in the class of 1952, the Harvard Registrar's Office says he attended only two semesters and never graduated. When Cowell attends the Red Cross Ball, he comes weighted down with all kinds of medals that he says he won in the Marine Corps. The Silver Cross is the biggest, Cowell told me. I got it on June 15, 1945. Based on a tip, I asked the Marine Corps about Cowell. A spokeswoman said that he won no medals, no ribbons, no de decorations, no awards. When told the news, Cowell was, was resigned. He said, I don't want any controversy with the Corps or anything else. He later conceded your comments about the medals are fairly accurate. In fact, um, he conceded that rather than graduating from Harvard as he had listed himself in the social directory, he actually won his degree through a correspondence school. Welcome to Palm Beach. Finally, Heather Weiser Pratt, a member of the old guard who uh, grew up in Palm Beach. And uh, as she says, I went uh, everywhere when I was three with my nanny in a stretch limousine. Uh, 
Near the end of the season, I asked her what happens at the end. Of course, I could see for myself, parking was becoming easier on Worth Avenue, which is uh, Palm Beach's answer to R Rodeo Drive, although in fact, Rode Rodeo Drive looks like a slum compared with Worth Avenue, where people like Adnan Khashoggi and the Sultan Brunei put down $100,000 in five minutes of shopping. Uh, reservations were not always needed for dinner at Taboo. The locals were reclaiming their island, even finding time to enjoy the sunsets. Ironically, the most beautiful feature of the island is totally free. And what does everyone do when the season is, is over? I asked Heather Weiser Pratt. Celebrate, she said. I'd like to take questions. I think that's the most fun part of a talk. And I'd like to hear from you. Any, any reactions? If you're going to ask a question, we ask you to step to the microphone here on the yes. floor. Yes, you want to um, step to the microphone? If you can come around to, to do that, uh, because this session is being taped by CNN, and uh, it'll make it easy for... C-SPAN, right. sorry. <laughs> C-SPAN. They may not run the tape. <laughs> Excuse me. And, um, and this will make it much easier uh, to have it. They can edit out my false reference. I wasn't sure I could get up here from that desk. Uh, my, my question has to do with the anti-Semitism you referred to, because I know that George Gershwin wrote much of his music in Palm Beach. And, and, and I honestly don't know whether he actually ever lived there, whether he was someone's guest. But were things different back then in the early 30s? Than, or was the anti-Semitism the same? I never heard that. I, I, I question that, whether he actually did that. Oh, yeah, he wrote, well, yeah. for example, the variations on I Got Rhythm, he wrote all that at Palm mm, Beach. Okay. And bragged about the fact that he wrote it there. I yeah. see. Wow. That's news to me. Um, now, in the, in the 30s, of course, things were worse. Uh, I would say that, that Palm Beach is a, a town frozen in time, perhaps in the 1940s, and uh, even, uh, uh, and maybe even in the 1930s. And back then, um, Jews simply didn't exist. I don't know how, if, you know, he, he was able to, to manage to, to uh, even come to the island. Uh, it was totally wasp. Marjorie Mary Weather Post presided over everything. And uh, you, you, you simply could not uh, function in, in Palm Beach if you were Jewish. Thank you. But thank you. Uh, I might say that, that Besides being Jewish, I, I had never had any exposure to society. My uh, father was a biochemist at Columbia University. My mother was a concert pianist, still is. My, my stepfather was a physicist at, at MIT. I lived in Belmont uh, in, the Boston, in a Boston suburb. Um, I didn't have the slightest idea what society was all about. And uh, so this was all new to me as well. And, uh, totally fascinating, really, to study this place as in an, a, a cultural anthropo anthropological study uh, and to see how the very rich live and to see these social customs and rituals and, and learn what it means to be part of society was, was a totally new experience for me. Another question? Yes. I came here expecting maybe some accounts of other than the trite the, the ones that do like all middle class does, and that's the spending of money, the foolishness of decisions that they're making. There must be certain levels of intelligence there that you're, that I would like to know about in that, uh, in that. I mean, maybe they're foolish, but I don't know if you've geared that for a Nashville audience or what, but it's, uh, you seem not to be showing anything but the trite. Mm. Uh, well, I think that, uh, these bizarre stories are, are, are something that people are interested in because uh, they take you into a different world. And uh, perhaps it's escapism, uh, but it's, it's fascinating. I think, I think everyone wants to know how the other half live. But there are real people in Palm Beach. There are people who actually uh, produce things, who were successful in business, and I, included that as part of the book as well. Uh, for example, someone by the name of Phil Romano, I'm sure very few people have heard of Phil Romano, but he founded uh, such national restaurant chains as Fuddruckers, the hamburger chain, and other very well-known national chains. 
uh, and uh, he originally was from the Palm Beach area, uh, and then uh, started a restaurant there. He moved to Houston, became successful. His whole shtick, if you will, is to offer something new. And when he first started Fuddruckers, uh, he would display the hammer hamburger patties uh, in these cases. He would bake his own buns. He would grind his own meat. And he was told by everyone in the business, you can't do that at that price level. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's close to a McDonald's price, and, and you simply can't make money that, that way. And he, d he did. He disregarded the advice. And that's exactly what attracted people to this very successful chain, the fact that it was different. Uh, and uh, he calls it the, the point of difference. And uh, so you get these, these vignettes, vignettes about, about uh, the wealthy and the, and the famous. Um, now he has a home in Palm Beach. He has two Rolls Royces. He has a lovely blonde wife who was formerly a manager of, of Fuddruckers. And uh, he's enjoying the Palm Beach lifestyle. And of course, like all people in Palm Beach, he wears no, no socks. He wears uh, boat shoes or moccasins uh, with no socks. This is again part of the uh, part of the uniform uh, that people wear in Palm Beach. Uh, so you get a, a, a slice of, of all these different layers of, of life in Palm Beach, including what the bartenders see. Um, the another uh, bartender uh, at, at Chuck and Harold's, a, a major watering hole, uh, describes what goes on when when. Uh, these uh, men, wealthy men, come in, and these young girls, 50 years younger in, in some cases, uh, start showing their cleavage and wearing their short skirts, and uh, and you can imagine what happens after that. Uh, it's it's uh, perhaps a story that goes on in almost any town, but but in Palm Beach, everything is enhanced. Everything is in more ways than one. Everything is magnified. And uh, the, uh, the stories are, are, are remarkable, just, just one, one story after another. There does seem to be um, a sense of, in reading the book, that m most of these people are, are people who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Um, and yet, um, it would seem that as a writer, you have to at some point find someone in all of that mix that you have uh, some feeling for and, and some sense of, of their worthiness as a person and their contributions to, to society beyond the social season society. Uh, what, what were the, the broader aspects of some of your... Um, who didn't make the cut in the book? Well. Of course, quite a few people didn't make the cut, but you know there were a lot of people who did, but but were not the major characters. In the course of of going to the balls and and uh, going to all the events, uh, my wife Pam and I met uh, just any number of of people uh, who were fascinating. Helen Beam is one. She uh, is the head of Beam Porcelain, which makes these uh, uh, figurines that appear in the White House. That that uh, appear in the Vatican and Buckingham Palace. And she tells the story of her life, how she uh, is able to cultivate people. Uh, she, in fact, is one of the people that Kirby Caluris, the walker, escorts to, to balls. And, and so I would, I would go with her and with Kirby to some of the functions. We went to brunch at Mar-a-Lago, for example. Uh, and Kirby, um, besides escorting these wealthy women, uh, had a boyfriend uh, on the side by the name of Bill, and Bill would keep getting in trouble with the law. He, he uh, was arrested, resisted arrest, uh, he had a drinking problem, but yet Bill uh, Kirby somehow found this person very attractive. In fact, physically, he is very attractive. Uh, and uh, somehow he was never able to quite understand that Bill really was not going to respond to his help. Kirby has a $3 million home in Palm Beach that he got as part of a divorce settlement with his wife. And uh, Bill would stay there, and then he would, he would start drinking, and he would start calling people at 2 in the morning, and then the police would have to be called, uh, and there would be other disturbances, and the police would take him across 
the bridge to West Palm Beach, and uh, somehow Kirby would never learn that uh, as much as he wanted to help Bill, Bill really had to help himself. Uh, finally, Bill ended up in jail for six months, and even then, Kirby would, would take uh, clothes to him, would, would visit him in jail, would get collect calls from, from uh, Bill that he would accept from jail. And so this caused a, a major uh, uh, drama within uh, Kirby's circle in Palm Beach, which is a major slice of Palm Beach. And everybody would offer their advice. Helen Beam would say, you know, this guy is no good. You have to get rid of him, Kirby. And Kirby said, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But, you know, he's, he's so endearing and he's so refreshing. And uh, when, I, when I talked to Bill, I mentioned something about Washington exposés, that this book on Palm Beach is, is not like a Washington expose, which is what I had done in the past, that it's more of a story, it's more of a, of a, of a, of a good read, I think. And, and Bill said, what's an expose? He didn't know what the word meant. And I had to explain it to him. So here's this, this Kirby Kaluris, who's very smart and very endearing, uh, going with this guy, Bill, uh, and at the same time, escorting well, wealthy women like Helen Beam and being in the, in the, in the company of, of some of the top people in, in, in society, some of the most successful people in the country. Uh, and so you had this, this story that went throughout the book. And uh, these, are, these are very interesting people. Uh, Barton Goodman, the social queen of Palm Beach, is, is no airhead. Uh, she's, she's very smart. She could just as well be a CEO of a company. She's very direct, as you could tell from uh, some of her comments. And yet she knows everything that goes on in Palm Beach. She, as she says, I'm the one who put them on the board. I'm the one who put them on the board of the Red Cross. I know how they work. I know how the pretenders try to, how to, how to social climb. I know how, to, how they try to, to, to become chair of the Red Cross ball, which, which is the pinnacle. Uh, there was always this conniving, there's always this backbiting. Um, and uh, so in the end, what, what does happen when you, when you achieve everything that you want to achieve? And most people do want to be su successful. Most people do want to make money. Uh, what happens when you achieve all that you could possibly achieve? When you have hundreds of millions of dollars, even billions of dollars? Um, this is the book that tells you what happens. And uh, if, if it's a sad tale in some ways, if happiness doesn't buy money, if in fact uh, it, it turns out that, that, that these people start suing their family members and uh, uh, getting into terrific jams, drinking, uh, driving their jaguars into, into trees at night, uh, then that's the reality. That's, in fact, the way it is. And uh, in the end, that's, that was my purpose, to depict how this society works. Dr. Bertram Brown, a, a former director of the National Institute of Mental Health, a psychiatrist, read the book, and he said that it was obscenely engrossing, uh, that it was an anthropological study in how the very rich li live. I couldn't put it down. Uh, and so even though, even though it's titillating, even though it has juicy stories, I think in the end it is, it does have a serious theme uh, so that, and that is simply how the rich live and the fact that the very rich are very different from you and me. Would you talk for a moment or two about your technique and how you go about doing this kind of book and the other books that you've written in the sense of how do you get inside and um, how do you uh, protect yourself from uh, people who change their minds about what they've said? I tape record every interview, unless it's some very minor chit-chat, uh, uh, social comment. Uh, everything in the book is from a tape recording. Um, and that is important because, of course, these people are not used to being interviewed necessarily, and uh, sometimes when they read what they said, they're a little surprised. Uh, but in fact, they did say it. Um, with, with many of the ma major characters, I also did them the courtesy of, of, uh, of showing them uh, a draft of, of the material before uh, 
the book was published because they had cooperated with me, and I, I just felt that I, uh, I wanted to do that. Um, but beyond that, uh, it's sort of a, uh, I guess, an art to present yourself in the proper way so that people will talk to you. Um, I didn't want to scare them off. At the same time, I didn't want to waste my time with people who really were not going to be candid. I would, I would sometimes say uh, direct, very direct things, you know, like, um, have you heard of any orgies? Uh, not that the answer necessarily made any difference, but, but uh, people who didn't want to be truthful uh, were not going to talk to me, and I didn't want to talk to them. I wanted to talk to people who were really going to be uh, candid. Uh, in fact, orgies is a small part of life in, in Palm Beach, and, and uh, uh, so I, I do devote a few paragraphs to that. But um, I would also, in order to uh, overcome the fact that I am Jewish, I would sometimes mention that my second book was on Adnan Khashoggi, um, and that Khashoggi had invited me to his 50th birthday party in Marbella, Spain which I attended along with Pam and with Brooke Shields and a few other people. Uh, there, I went to a party on his yacht, the 282-foot Nabila, it was then called, which he later sold to Donald Trump. Um, and that would sort of relax people a bit. Um, I would also sometimes mention that when I went with my wife on vacation to Palm Beach, we, we, we'd stayed at the Four Seasons, and that would signal to them that, well, I wasn't someone who went to Comfort Inns, maybe I was uh, somewhat on their level, it would at least make them think that, that uh, I was not going to be there with my tongue hanging out, envious of their wealth, because the rich can sense when someone is envious of them, just like dogs can sense if uh, you're afraid of them. And uh, so I had to come across as, as someone who was on their le level or someone on their level, but at the same time, uh, someone who could be ir ir irreverent. Um, I recall when I interviewed the mayor of Palm Beach, Mayor Ilyinsky, who uh, comes from the Romanov family, the, the Russian, uh, the last Ro Russian czar. Uh, and everyone in, in Palm Beach is like that. Everyone has a colorful story, a success in his life, uh, whether, whether it's his own success or his family's success. Everyone has a brand name. Um, but the, the mayor at some point said, well, you know, Palm Beach is just an ordinary place. We have doctors and lawyers who live in the North End, and they go to work every day. Uh, and I said, oh, go to work in their Rolls Royces or on their yachts. And he realized that that wasn't going to work. And uh, very quickly, he was back talking about Palm Beach and, and the, re the reality of the place, which is that there's no place, as he put it, who ha that has more millionaires per square inch than Palm Beach. Um, and so it's a constant balance. Um, and uh, at the same time, ultimately, people don't move to Palm Beach unless they're aware of the scandals, of the scandalous reputation of the Roxanne Pulitzers, of the William, William Kennedy Smiths. And if they really wanted to be low profile, they would move to some other uh, more quiet place like Stewart or Jupiter Island uh, in, in, in Florida, which are very rich places, but don't have, not as rich as Palm Beach, but don't have the, the uh, scandalous reputation of Palm Beach. So I think that there are many people in Palm Beach who, who secretly do want to talk. Um, gossip is the coin of the realm in Palm Beach. They have nothing else to do. They have uh, uh, no work. Uh, their work is, is gossiping, is going to the balls, is wearing tiaras, uh, which are laden with diamonds so heavy that, that a lot of the women develop headaches, uh, buying $5,000 gowns, uh, buying $2,500 uh, tuxedos, buying $900 pairs of shoes. This is, this is their work. And uh, what goes on behind the scenes is, is uh, I find, quite engrossing. Other questions? If not, uh, I'll remind you that Mr. Kessler will be in the uh, colonnade uh, signing area immediately after this session. We want to thank him for being with us, and we want to thank C-SPAN for its coverage, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Scandalous novels and, and, and uh, uh, TV shows 
like uh, Dynasty, look like nursery rhymes. To tell a story, I decided to focus on a season, uh, to spend time, to go to the balls. I actually uh, spent a whole weekend with Donald Trump, with my wife Pam, flying down on his Boeing 727-100 uh, for the weekend, stayed at Mar-a-Lago with him, went to other events, including New Year's Eve with him. Uh, and uh, the cost of fuel alone for that trip down from New York, and I spent more flying up to New York from my home in Potomac, Maryland, than it would have cost to fly directly to Florida. But the cost of fuel for that one trip for that weekend was $40,000. Um, the way the book started was that after I had written the book on Joe Kennedy, my wife Pam and I would go back for vacations. We loved it. And one, after, one evening, uh, we had dinner at Testa's, one of the best Italian restaurants in Palm Beach. We had a bottle of Chardonnay, which is a little more than we are used to, being from Washington. And I was feeling very good. We walked around the block. And I said to Pam, wouldn't it be great to do a book on Palm Beach? And I was just shooting the breeze. But she said, that's the only book I would collaborate with you on because she's also a former Washington Post reporter and also an author. She wrote a book on the spy sites of Washington called Undercover Washington. And so at that point, it became a more serious idea. And besides focusing on the season, uh, I decided, as I got into it, to focus on four characters. Uh, these are people who see what goes on behind the scenes or who are major players themselves. One is Barton Gilbert. Different the rich of Palm Beach are from you and me, perhaps, is Ron Kessler. Mm. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. John L. Hainer married one of Europe's richest men. He was a tycoon in Italy. In 1980, they moved to the U.S. They bought a whole floor of the Trump Tower in New York. Two years later, they bought a half a floor of the most chic condominium in Palm Beach, the Biltmore. Frank, her husband, indulged her every whim. He bought her a 26-carat diamond ring, a 32-carat sapphire, a million-dollar Picasso, a white Corniche Rolls Royce. They traveled around the world five times collecting furniture, each item worth $500,000, $300,000. In time, Frank developed leukemia, and in 1995, in March, he died. It was poor timing, because March is the middle of the social season. In Palm Beach, everything revolves around the season. And as you know, Palm Beach is the most sinful, debauched, wealthy, self-indulgent place on the planet. So, Jana decided that she would embalm her husband and store him for 40 days at the local funeral home until the season was over. As she said to me, I wanted to go to the parties. I wanted to go to the party on the yacht with Ivana. I wanted to go to the party at Mar-a-Lago, Donald Trump's home. Uh, I didn't want to miss the season. I first came to Palm Beach. Good afternoon. My name is Bennett Tarleton. I work at the Tennessee Performing Arts Center. Our speaker today uh, has been inside many places, the CIA, the FBI, uh, Joseph Kennedy's family, uh, and a lot of other places, and now Palm Beach. I really appreciate it when a writer uh, provides what I consider to be the perfect introduction, and I don't have to dig very much. So I want to share just a little tiny bit of the season, uh, which is Ron Kessler's book, and I think it will serve as a really good introduction to him. My aunt, he writes, who lived in Scarsdale, was married to the county's uh, largest importer and distributor of artificial flowers. At their dinners, the chit-chat had to do with their lives, uh, their live-in servants, their trips to Paris, and the weddings they would eventually throw for their daughters at uh, the Pierre and the Plaza. I tried to imagine what their lives must be like. Palm Beach would give me the chance to find out, on a much grander scale, 
Writing books allows me to explore different, secret, powerful worlds. I can live the lifestyle of others without actually becoming a part of it. Ask questions I otherwise couldn't ask and learn, as in a cultural anthropological study, about people engaged in pursuits totally different from mine. Palm Beach fit all my criteria. In its own way, the town is as secret as the CIA, FBI, or Secret Service. Unless you know the combination, you don't get in. The residents are not only among the country's richest, they are among the nation's most powerful. And there is no question that the culture of Palm Beach is different. As F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about the very rich, they are different from you and me. And now to tell us about how to five years ago to do research on Joseph P. Kennedy for my book, The Sins of the Father. Most people don't realize that Palm Beach is actually an island and it's only 3.75 square miles. Its population year round is only 9,800. It swells to maybe 25,000 during the season. On this island live some of the wealthiest people in the world, people like Ron Perlman, Donald Trump, uh, Estee Lauder and her sons, uh, an heir to the Campbell Soup fortune, Diana Strawbridge Wister, uh, and you have the old guard with the old money with names like Ford, DuPont, Pillsbury, coexisting with the nouveau riche, people like James Clark, co-founder of uh, Netscape, of course Donald Trump, and their whole existence is based on social climbing, on going to the right parties, on celebrating the season, and uh, drinking champagne, having fine jewels, uh, eating beluga caviar. Answer machines are, are very rare on the island because the rich have no need to hear from anybody. They have their servants take messages if they happen to be in. Most of the time, they're away at their other homes. And the servants frequently don't speak English very well, so you spend five minutes trying to give them a message, and then very frequently the message comes out wrong. Um, the bill for electricity alone in many of these homes is $5,000 a month. The bill for the property taxes <clears throat> is <clears throat> typically $500,000 a year. Uh, the bill for landscaping might be $140,000 a year. Uh, and yet, these are only homes that most of them use for three or four months during the season. The rest of the time, they're in other places, in France, in Italy, uh, in the Hamptons, in Nantucket. Uh, but I was drawn to this town. It's full of bizarre characters. In fact, the more bizarre you are, the more you're prized, the more you're accepted. Uh, one of them, Neil Cargyle, is from Nashville, in fact, and uh, was a, a cross-dresser, uh, normally uh, seemingly uh, upstanding businessman with his own company, and yet he would love to dress up in high heels with mini skirts and uh, dance with women at these parties in Palm Beach. Uh, in fact, John Barron, author of Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, who previously made an appearance here, I understand he was only on a panel uh, initially before his book came out, uh, wrote about Neil Cargyle in The New Yorker magazine. But um, what happens is when these people congregate in this small little space, with all this money and very uh, little to do, lots of free time. It's as if laboratory rats were f fed hormones. All the human foibles, all the, the emotions, all the uh, sins of, of, of humanity seem to become magnified. And the stories of what goes on behind the hedges makes nurseries, uh, makes uh, uh, 